here. All right, so we're going to talk about lower GI and, and um, catch a few things on the upper GI. So first off, uh, let's turn on the overhead display, right? That would help you. Um, any questions about the lower, G, uh, the upper GI? You can't even remember it, can you? It's like it was a whole week ago. Who can remember? Um, some of the things, though, that we went over was the oral cancer, as I wait for this to warm up. Um, the oral cancer, stomach cancer. Now, remember with the stomach cancer, you're going to end up with a gastrectomy where the stomach is completely removed. Um, we talked about gastric decompression, dumping syndrome, TEN, TPN, gallbladder, cholecystitis, had my gallbladder removed and had pancreatitis at the same time. And so then we talked about pancreatitis too. Okay. And most of the cases of pancreatitis are due to gallbladders more than alcohol. But we have at Tri-City quite a few alcohol ones <laughs> related. So. Okay, so lower GI, go on to the next slide. Let's talk about inflammatory bowel disease. Um, I grouped together our Crohn's and our ulcerative colitis uh, because really um, a lot of the issues that people that have these diseases have are the same. They have a lot of the same remissions, exacerbations. They have a lot of the same uh, treatment modalities. Um, and mainly both of these are not curable and so it's dealing with a disease that they constantly has, have to live with. So, um, so let's talk about uh, this inflammatory bowel disease. It's most, more common in developed countries and urban areas. There's been a theory put out there that they think the reason why um, developed countries get uh, in more trouble is because they don't have parasites like the third world countries have. Hmm, I don't know. I'd rather have the inflammatory bowel than the parasite. Uh, it does say here that it is one of the one of five most prevalent GI diseases in the United States as far as cost. So, so let's look at the first one, Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is Apache inflammatory lesions. They call them skip lesions. Um, they're located in the small and the large intestine, particularly the distal ileum, not a good place to have it, and the entire thickness of the bowel is affected. So when we look at this here, on the first one here, do you see how it's all over? So it's kind of skip lesions, that's where the name comes. So we could have it anywhere, but the big difference is it goes through that entire thickness. That's not good. Uh, ulcerative colitis, on the other hand, is uh, inflammation and ulceration of the colon, and it starts in the rectum, and it spreads progressively upward. Um, and only the mucosal, or mainly the mucosal lining, is affected. So we're going to start here, and it's going to go up. Much easier to control, surgically at least, okay? Um, and just that the mucosal lining is the main part that's involved is also another good thing compared to the Crohn's. So what do we think the causes are? Well, they believe that there's maybe a, they used to say very strongly that there was a genetic component, but now they're leaning a little bit more to the altered immune response. So they're kind of in between right now. So we'll see where they go in another year or two as far as defining what really is the problem here. Symptoms, uh, abdominal cramps, both of them have abdominal cramps and they all both have chronic urgent diarrhea. Um, with the Crohn's disease, you'll see uh, it could be very pale in color um, and what we call that there is the steatorrhea, that is where it's very pale, it has fat in it. In other words, that your body is just expelling out the fat, okay? So um, that is something that you can see with the Crohn's. With the ulcerative colitis, you tend to see more blood. And that makes sense because it's down at the, at the end there, so we tend to see more of that. Uh, they may have a fever. They will have weight loss. They will have electrolyte imbalances. They will eventually have, have anemia. Their albumin will be down. Um, these patients really have a hard time maintaining their weights um, and their health because they get in trouble with um, the uh, disease. Um, they also are at more risk for colon cancer 
and they uh, live a life of remissions and exacerbations. Treatment, let's see. Treatment, well let's look at the goals of treatment. The, treat the treatment here is we want to control inflammation, one. We want to m prevent complications and we want to maintain nutrition. So, the first one that we're going to look at is inflammation. Do I have that on another page? No. Yes, I do. Okay. So, um, we want to control the inflammation on that one. Uh, we want to use the uh, CRP as a baseline. Remember when we talked about uh, C-reactive protein is something that we should not have in our uh, blood except when inflammation is going on. So that we use this uh, particular uh, blood test as a baseline to see how the patient is doing. Uh, symptoms of the inflammatory response that we'll see in our patient is we will see uh, we want to look that we have controlled those symptoms and so one of the ways that we do that is we want to decrease the amount of I'm not saying this wrong let's try it again okay in inflammation there's certain things that are going to be inflamed and so let's look at some of the specific symptoms that we see that are reflective of that inflammation one is the diarrhea and the abdominal pain so how can we help with that so we can help with that by uh, having a diet and we'll talk about the diet in, in a little bit, um, what kind of diet would be appropriate for these patients. We're also going to control it with antidiarrheals. And so with antidiarrheals, one of the, um, our favorite ones to go with is Lamotil. Can you guys see that? Huh. And also another one is Imodium. Oh, I'm really right, not writing big enough, aren't I? Imodium, okay? These are wonderful, can you see them? Yes, oh, that would help me. Yeah, this is not, nobody has a dry eraser, do they? I think I already have at some time in my life. <laughs> not in this room, but in other rooms. <laughs> okay, so Lamotil and Imodium, okay? These are wonderful antidiarrheals, okay? But, they're little tiny little pills and uh, so because they're tiny and little it's easy to think they don't pack much of a punch but they do and so what will end up happening is some patients and especially some nurses the patient will have diarrhea they'll give one of these and then they'll want to give another one and another one and then they end up getting bound up so you really have to be careful and think to yourself do I really want to give this yet or do I want to wait? Usually you'll see they'll have like an eight hour limit before you give the next one and there's a good reason why, okay? So you don't want to overdo it with these, okay? Um, another way that we can help with the diarrhea and abdominal pain is with an antispasmodic. Uh, Bentil is one of the popular ones too for this. Bentil is an antispasmodic that will help with that spasms in the colon, okay? Um, the other thing that was, so those were the symptoms we were trying to control, those, that diarrhea and the abdominal pain. We also want to uh, look at what the cause is. And so based on what the cause is will depend on what kind of medication we want to go with. Um, so first things that we look at is they do go with the amniosalicylates or 5-ASAs. Uh, the one most uh, popular is the azofatine, and I'm not, as, I'm not going to test you on this. This is, should be reinforced in what you're hearing in farm, okay? Um, you just have to be careful about this particular drug because uh, if you're allergic to sulfa. How many people are allergic to sulfa here? I'm the only one, okay, all right. Uh, antibiotics are another group of medications that we would use t for any infections that are going on. Corticosteroids are another medication, and we usually just use this for flare-ups uh, when, when they have uh, exacerbated, uh, we, but we do not use this long-term. Uh, and remember, what do we need to do with prednisone once we give it? Okay. We need to taper off, exactly. Okay. Uh, another group of meds that are used are the immunomodulators. 
um, also known as immunosuppressants. Uh, this is to help focus on that altered uh, immune response and trying to maintain remission. The monoclonal antibodies are another group. Uh, this one is one to enhance the uh, immune system. And this is used when nothing else is working for the patient. Okay, so we, we've attacked the symptoms, we've attacked the cause. Now let's make sure that we don't get any complications. Now when we look at complications, um, some of the things that we typically see with these uh, diseases is one, um, and actually uh, these complications are less frequent with the ulcerative colitis and the, uh, Crohn's has more complications. So when we look at this, some of the problems are malnutrition, strictures, and fistulas. Okay. So malnutrition, let's look at that one. Uh, severe malnutrition and malabsorption. Well, basically, because the GI tract is not working, we're not absorbing the way that we need to, right? So that means we're not going to get the nutrients that we need to get, fluid-wise and, and nutrient-wise. So one of the, some of the things that we could see with this patient is dehydration, hypokalemia, um, because of all these poor wound healing, poor fistula healing. And really one of the main things to remember about these patients is they easily can get fistulas because they're malnourished. And so the way to prevent fistulas with these patients is nutrition. I'll go over that. I have that a little farther down in my lecture notes. So what can we do for treatment for malabsorption? We want to get them going on some kind of uh, nutrient. If they're not able to take it orally, um, then we want to go with TPN. If they can go, uh, if they can't take it orally, but we could do a TEN, that would be great. We need to fortify their nutrition in some way, okay? Uh, we need to give them some kind of supplemental nutrition. So this is a patient that we would be doing frequent meals and uh, trying to really up those calories, okay? Um, another problem that these patients have is strictures and intestinal obstruction, or as you guys know it at Tri-City, small bowel obstructions. Um, this is a common thing that happens because of the uh, changes in their GI tract. And so treatment for that would be, well, hopefully we want to prevent it. So the way to prevent that is definitely to uh, uh, help them with their nutrition. So always, once again, going back to that nutrition and trying to control the disease. Uh, fistulas are a common problem. Uh, these are deep ulcers that turn into tracts that tunnel to another area. Um, so this is more common in Crohn's than it is in ulcerative colitis because remember, Crohn's is the one that has the full thickness involved here. So we want to give them a diet that is high in protein and high in calorie. Drainage may need to have a wound vac or pouching on it. It's not uncommon that we've had to, where we've had fistulas coming to the abdomen and where we've had to literally put like a colostomy bag on it to collect the drainage. Um, other times we've put a wound vac over it to try and get it under control. Um, skin irritation from the affluence, so in other words, that drainage that's coming, this uh, rectal uh, drainage, is affluent, uh, it's, is what it's called an affluent, and it is very irritating to the skin. Um, so we need to really protect the skin by using some kind of skin barrier cream or um, calolone, calolone, the swab that you can get. Have you guys been taught about calolone? Am I saying it? I'm saying it right. I know I'm saying it right. Cavalon. Um, that is really effective for the skin, but there's also other uh, ones that uh, Tri-City has that has uh, the skin barrier. So you just always, wherever you go to a new hospital, talk to the ACT and see what is the skin barrier cream that they have there and utilize that. Not cal. It's not that. No, it's Cavalon. It comes in like a have you guys used that before? Yeah. yeah, you should always use that on your surrounding skin around a dressing change, okay? And you'll really see that because the area will be so irritated, it'll remind you and say, okay, let's put something on here to protect it, okay? Another thing that we want to do is maintain nutrition. 
Um, we had talked about control the inflammation, prevent the complications. Now we're maintaining the nutrition. Um, on these patients, we do put them on bowel rest when they're in their um, uh, moment of mo most amount of symptoms. We'll make them MPO. And so then we do need to supplement them with IVs and if uh, necessary, put them on TPN. Um, once they are able to go on to a diet, they should be on a bland diet. And on a bland diet, they should be on what we call a kappa, a kappa, free diet, okay? So the, cap the C means no caffeine, the A means no alcohol, the P means no pepper, and the other A is no aspirin. So these are all items that will trigger um, problems for a patient with inflammatory bowel. We also want to encourage them to have a low residue diet. Um, and one of the uh, ones that, I don't know if I really like it, but some of you might. It has a, where did I put it? I lost it. Um, it is Lors, is the, uh, where this other one is Kappa. This one's going to be Lors, to remember it. Okay, and lures, what that means is limited fried food, zero milk, real fresh fish, eggs boiled, and everything strained. My mother-in-law suffers from ulcerative colitis, and she pretty much ends up on baby food when she gets in a lot of trouble. So it's very strained. Um, and very specific. I don't really like that an acronym what, uh, that they wrote because it's like, why would limited, zero, real fresh? I mean, anyways, make up your own. Um, that was one I stole from one of the, uh, I can't even find where I stole it from. I must have disliked it so much I threw it out. Anyways, so that's one method too. Okay. Uh, the other thing that we need to really focus on is a high-protein, high-calorie diet. We're talking 3,000 calories, okay, that we need to uh, encourage this patient to take. And we need to also give supplemental vitamins. Uh, the way to accomplish this is probably small, frequent meals. Um, and, of course, uh, just like they said, uh, let's see, under Lourdes, did they say zero milk? We really do need to stay away from any lactose proper. Uh, anything uh, with milk in it, no lactose, uh, because milk actually increases the diarrhea and the pain and the flatulence. And my uh, mother-in-law uses that lactate uh, for her milk. So, um, and then um, anemia is another problem that these patients do have as a result of not maintaining good nutrition and blood loss and things like that. Um, so we do want to consider iron supplements or uh, epigen or even B12 shots. Try and help this patient uh, maintain their RBCs. And uh, one thing about nutrition as we go on, um, and of course I have a lot of sympathy here because I can barely keep myself from eating all the wrong things and I don't have any GI issues, okay? But I, I'm always blowing my diet. And one of the things that I've noticed with my mother-in-law is that she'll go a very long period of time where she won't have any problems. And then she starts thinking, as we all do, oh, I can have a little bit of that. And so she does. And maybe she'll get away with it for one time, but then she does it the second time, and then she's in lots of trouble, and then she's down. And it takes her a long time to come back up. It takes a couple of months. And so, and then if you add any kind of stress or any kind of problems in the family, which there's always something going on, uh, it just puts you down and out. And so then it takes her so long to get back up and going. And then it makes her a little fearful because then she's afraid to try anything again, afraid to go out and get uh, in, around infected people. And it just uh, is not a good cycle. So um, this is a any of our chronic diseases, whether it be GI or you'll go through other ones we're going to talk about, not so much with, uh, with me, but definitely when you get into the respiratory and cardiac, living with a chronic disease uh, 
really does take a lot of mental uh, fortitude, I think. I remember I was sick with my pregnancy. My daughter, I was just throwing up the whole time. I don't think I started feeling halfway decent until six months out. And I was tired of it at three months. <laughs> three months. I, went, I thought to myself, what a wussy you are. That uh, Three months. My gosh, people go through diseases a lifetime. You know, and so I really realized the effect of, of a chronic disease, you know, even after three months. I realized I, I hope I don't get any. Okay. Um, all right. What can we do for these patients besides all those other things that we're doing? We do want to uh, talk about surgery. And, of course, as a surgical nurse, I'm always going for the surgery. But let's talk about what would be, if we went ahead and tried to resolve this issue with surgery, what... How successful do you think that would be? It does, but I'll tell you the problem is is that because this disease can just keep on going, you could keep on taking out parts of the intestine and never get it, and especially with the Crohn's. Uh, you can end up giving this person a short gut syndrome where they have very little intestinal, um, very little intestine to actually absorb. And I had a patient over at um, one of the convalescent homes. She was in her 40s, and um, early 40s. And she was in the convalescent home there. Uh, and the thing about her that really struck me, I thought, why is such a young person in the hospital, you know, here? And sh the problem was is that she had had so many surgeries that she ended up that she had really no intestine. So basically, when she would eat, you know, she ate uh, anything, we would see it come out of her ileostomy, you know. And so, because she had a, such a high ileostomy. And so she had to be on TPN around the clock. And so this is the reason why she stayed in the um, facility. Um, that was a while back. That was when I was working at Palomar um, College. Now probably they'd send her home with it and teach her how to take care of that infusion therapy. And that, by the way, is another job is for an RN, is the infusion therapy. So log that away is another thing you can do. Um, just a lot of traveling. Uh, so um, going on, uh, this is, uh, so when we look at Crohn's, uh, we say intestinal uh, resection for the obstruction or perforation is the usual reason why we're going to go in and do surgery, but because of the widespread disease, it makes it very difficult. Uh, the goal is to preserve the intestine as much as possible and to avoid this short bowel syndrome. Um, they say here that 67% will require surgery at some time. Um, ulcerative colitis, on the other hand, uh, the severe cases will go ahead and do a total colectomy. If you think about where that inflammation is, you could see that if we just went above that, got rid of the bottom part, we would be uh, able to completely eradicate that disease. And so a total colectomy with uh, an ileoanal reservoir or a permanent ileostomy uh, can actually provide a cure for this disease but they would have to have that for the rest of their lives. And some patients, after they've been dealing with it for so long, that they would rather do that. Um, they say here that in 25% to 33% surgery um, is considered a cure after the colon is removed. So not, complete, not a complete cure, but 33% um, is a third. Well, that's not good odds. Okay. Um, so, and we'll talk about the ileoanal reservoir and the ileostomy as we move on and talk to you about uh, the uh, fecal diversions at the end of this lecture. Nursing uh, interventions. Well, what do we want to do as nurses for these patients? Well, we want them to rest. We want to maintain accurate INOs because we want to see how much stooling they actually are having so we can measure that. Um, amount of nutritional and, and fluid loss. Uh, we want to teach the patient about their prescribed medications and diet, and you can see that that would, that would be pretty time consuming. Uh, poor nutrition makes the symptoms worse, and we really need to stress that. Nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. We really want to get them involved in support groups because there is no cure for this, and the reality is, is that 
there's always new things coming and there's always new ways to do things and living with a disease every day um, you can get that best information from other people that live with that disease rather than from your medical health providers. They're not as current as what the support group will be. The support group has been internet searching and finding every little thing that could be out there, trying different things, different appliances, different this, different that, and they usually are pretty current. So I would really recommend that. Uh, Tri-City has actually a group that meets uh, regularly, I think every month. Um, I've gone down there uh, to uh, meet them, and they're just a really all ages, but predominantly older ages, um, and they know everything you could possibly know about, especially about uh, fecal diversions and the appliances. And the vendors come in, too, you know. So all the vendors come in and give more stuff so that there's other uh, ways to try things, and some of them are good and some of them aren't. So definitely you want the support groups. And then we also want to encourage this patient to have an annual colonoscopy so that we can um, make sure that there are no problems. Because remember, they are at risk for colon cancer. Okay. Um, um, intestinal obstruction is uh, also called small bowel obstructions. Uh, definition, this is any condition preventing fecal contents from passing through the intestine, uh, and it's sometimes called an ileus. Uh, you'll also see small bowel obstruction, SBO. So what are the different types and causes? Um, I know quite a few of you have seen some small bowel obstructions at Tri-C, so this will be very helpful um, for you. Um, but the types and causes, it can be either mechanical or non-mechanical. Mechanical obstruction, this results when the lumen of the intestine is blocked. Um, now, various things can block um, the intestine. Tumor is the most common one that we see as we work with our patients, uh, but fecal impaction is also considered um, an obstruction. A hernia can cause an obstruction by pressing in on the intestine. Uh, any kind of twisted or kinked bowel can happen. Um, as well as uh, intestinal adhesions, you know, scar, bands of scar tissue from previous surgeries can also uh, cause an obstruction, um, as well as a foreign body. When I was working in the ED, um, we had a patient that came in who had um, been using a vinegar bottle for some sexual stimulation, and um, it ended up going up too far in the intestine, and he couldn't get it out. So we had to go in and do surgery. We, they had a doll head? They ate? Oh, so they, it went this way. Okay. The ones that I, we've had, I, I haven't seen this one, but my friend that worked at another hospital in L.A. Uh, told me about it, where uh, somebody put a gerbil into a plastic bag, and then they, and then it goes right up your intestine, and it's, it's a sexually, and I don't know if it was or not, but anyways. But it's happened not from just him. It, it, it's, it, and if you think about it, it's a stimulant of the GI. That's right. It moves up. But then once it's up high enough, they can't get it out, so then you have to remove it in surgery. Oh, everything that you could think of. I've already told you guys that. Everything you can think of. When I went through, uh, did I tell you guys about the driftwood? Okay, so, I was, so when I first did my OR rotation with Mrs. Hamamoto, she took me through and she, uh, we were going through and we were going through the pathology lab and there was a uterus and it had a piece of driftwood. And, uh, she, and she, they had found a piece of driftwood in this lady's uterus. That's probably why she was having problems. Um, and, I, and she said, anything you can imagine, that can be put in the body, you will see or hear about. So that was the beginning of our, my adventure as an RN, um, driftwood. Uh, um, I've also had where they've taken a, um, the nut that you have, uh, you know, you, nut and bolt, the nut where a man has put it around his penis to hold up his erection and then couldn't get it off. So we had to, take him to surgery to relax him enough to get it off. <laughs> I 
Was was. Am I missing something here? Oh, Vicky has Vicky has plenty of stories too. Yeah, yeah, it, it'll happen. And of course, she was she was really she was really a med surgeon nurse, so she didn't have as much. How is how come he's getting picked on here? I don't know. I'm not saying your name to keep it cool. A <laughs> Okay, and that's said. How okay. What they had to do is they had to they relaxed him enough, and then I they put a syringe in and pulled out some of the excess blood that was in there, and then they were able to relax it. Yeah, it was a fun one. Okay. Um, okay. So we can have foreign bodies. We can also have a non-mechanical uh, obstruction. And let's talk about the different types of non-mechanical. The two different types are either a neurogenic or a vascular. On the neurogenic obstruction, this is where the nerve transmission uh, to the bowel is interrupted, and it's usually called a paralytic ileus. This is the most common thing that we see post-op. This is ha examples of this that can happen are from handling the bowel during surgery. If any of you get to see a bowel surgery, when they open it up, they literally pull the bowel out onto the abdomen and so and they manipulate through it and so this is one of those situations that they can really um, end up causing nerve temporary nerve problems uh, who somebody saw a laparoscopic that ended up yeah you ended up seeing one that started out as as a robotic and then it ended up being they opened it because they weren't able to and he was feeling throughout all the intestine if I remember what you said trying to yeah. find Right. And that's once he went to the traditional surgery and then he was able to feel through all the way through, yes. And you could see how all that handling and manipulation of the bowel would then end up giving you a, a paralytic ileus post-op. Um, and it's temporary. Also medications can also uh, temporarily paralyze the bowel. But we need to remember that if we have a patient that we know just had a lot of manipulation of their bowel and then we go ahead and give these narcotics or our Imodium and our Lomatil, which slows down the GI tract, we can really cause some issues here for our patients. So we have to think about that. Uh, vascular obstruction occurs when the blood flow to the portion of the bowel is interrupted. This is called intestinal ischemia. Uh, and this happens when there is some kind of intestinal thrombus or arterial sclerosis to the area. The most common thing that I usually see is they'll have a blood clot to the me their mesenteric artery. That's the most common one that I've seen. And this is one that we don't see that often, okay? Um, okay, but regardless of whether it's mechanical or non-mechanical, there's some things that we will see with our patients. So first thing, the symptoms that we will see is abdominal pain. Uh, we will hear bor borborygmy. I had to write it out here to make sure I said it right. Borborygmy. Um, borborygmy. Um, bowel sounds, these are high pitched at the site of the obstruction. So they're very, very high pitched. Uh, you'll see constipation, nausea. And with a complete obstruction, we will see no gas or feces being uh, expelled rectally, and they may actually get to a point where they will vomit fecal material. And we've had a patient do, we've had patients do that. Left untreated, there will be signs of shock, and it can be fatal. We'll also see with other things that we'll see with our patients is that they will have metabolic acidosis. Um, I'm sorry, metabolic alkalosis, that's if it's an upper GI obstruction. So if we um, have anything above the belt, um, is the way I remember it, you're going to have acid that they're getting rid of. Everything above, you know, if you think about your stomach, what does it produce? HCL, and that's an acid. 
So w if we lose that by throwing up, which is what's going to happen, then this patient's going to end up in alkalosis, okay, because they're losing too much acid. If they have a lower GI obstruction, they will most likely go into a, uh, a metabolic acidosis. That's because below the belt <laughs> is all your bases. If you think about all the things that we have in there, the lipase, the amylase, the chyme, those are all bases. And so we want, and when we lose those through diarrhea, we will then be uh, at losing uh, too much bases. And so that will end up, that patient will be in metabolic acidosis. And now, Today we're talking lower GI, next week we'll do GU, but the following week will be acid-base balance and we'll talk even more specifically about this so it all will relate. Uh, labs that we can see with this uh, patient that might have problems is, uh, what do you think their WBC would be? High, it's gonna be high, absolutely. And of course, uh, this patient will lose uh, fluids uh, they probably have some problems with dehydration, and whenever that happens, that is going to impact your H and H, especially because it's uh, a dilution. So if it's too concentrated, it will also affect your BUN and creatinine, and it will affect your electrolytes from the fluid losses. So you would want to look at those. Uh, treatment. Treatment for this patient. Well, if it's a fecal impaction, we want to remove that. Who was it, Lydia? Were you the one that had the patient with? Uh, yeah, with the fecal impaction, we didn't get to remove it, but the nurse did remove it. So, um, <laughs> darn. <laughs> oh, I know I'm getting older because I, 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 I say it so, like, non-enthusiastically, you know. But anyways, normally I would have been dragging you in there. Um, prevention, fecal impaction removal. Well, the best thing is to prevent it because elderly people really get in trouble with this. Um, and so prevention is a high fiber diet, fluids, uh, exercise. These are the predominant things that will help prevent a patient from getting in trouble with this. And if they're not able to maintain a high fiber diet, maybe they need to take some kind of a medication such as Metamucil or um, any of those ones that, uh, consoles, another one, that will uh, increase the amount of fiber that you're taking and just drink that in the morning. Uh, another thing that we want to focus on with our patient is uh, their diet. Um, that means that we need to be sure that they're getting enough fluids, IV fluids. If they're not, we need to make sure that we move them over to TPN. Uh, this patient is typically on is MPO, and so um, as they're uh, recovering from um, this obstruction, uh, putting anything down is not a good thing. It's like a dam. It's just going to obstruct there, and the more you make, let them eat or drink or whatever, it's just going to cause them to be more nauseated and have more problems. So uh, typically this patient will be on uh, MPO. It's not uncommon for us to put an NG tube in place. You can tell it's Wednesday. They come by and do the leaf blower out there. Hey, uh, thank you. Um, so we're going to do gastric decompression for this patient. That means that we'll put a Salem sump in uh, to be able to uh, drain out whatever uh, fluids that they have. We will uh, also want to consider what kind of medications would be appropriate for this patient. And we really want to stay away from the non-narcotic analgesics. Remember that opioids are going to slow everything down. It will also mask the sim symptoms. So we really, that is not the drug of choice. However, you will see that in real practice, we tend to give the opioids to help them. But remember, that's going to not help your case here. Uh, antibiotics will be given if we think that there's any kind of risk for perforation. And uh, many obstructions will require a surgery, um, what we call an exploratory laparotomy, um, where the, they will go in and remove part of the PAL obstruction and um, just the portion that needs to be removed. Um, sometimes, if uh, they can, they'll wait it out. Um, there's kind of two schools of thought. The, some of them, they'll go right in and resolve, take care of it. Other ones will wait and put the NG tube and try and wait it out and hopefully see if it gets resolved. Um, especially if the patient is not a good candidate for surgery, that's a good idea. Also, uh, some of the new things coming out is they believe that if you go in to remove that section, uh, that tissue might be too friable, 
and they might have to remove more than they want to, and meaning friable because it's inflamed. Um, so some, some people, uh, some doctors now are waiting, uh, letting them get through the, uh, uh, the problem, and then if it's still an issue, doing a surgery when it's uh, less um, irritated and inflamed, okay? So you'll see both, uh, all three methods, where they'll wait it out, they'll do surgery later, or they'll do surgery now, okay? Um, okay, now in the case of uh, cancer, uh, they have to go in and remove that section, and, and usually a fecal diversion will be done, depending on the location of where the tumor is, will depend on what, what type of fecal diversion that you'll get. But a colostomy is a very common one that will be used. All right, let's look at peritonitis. This is what will happen when things really go awry and uh, fecal contents end up in the peritoneum. So pathophysiology, it's inflammation of the peritoneum due to irritants. Uh, the most common one that we see in the hospital is feces because of a perforation to the bowel. But it can also be um, gastric acid from like a, an ulcer, a peptic ulcer, gastric ulcer. Uh, so then that uh, gastric acid ends up in the uh, peritoneum. We can also have blood in the peritoneum that can happen. We'll see this predominantly with our ectopic pregnancies as they um, end up uh, uh, breaking through the uh, tubal. It's a tubal pregnancy. It breaks through. Then there's a, a lot of bleeding related to that. Um, and then uh, other things that can happen is, let's see here, bacteria. Let's say that you were stabbed in the abdomen. Uh, you, that would be an entry of a bacteria. Also, when we have a patient that has a peritoneal a dialysis, which you'll study in third semester, they put a trocar into the peritoneum and they do all the dialysis through the peritoneum using it as a filter. Um, it's not uncommon for that trocar to get infected. So, um, because you're, there's, here's a way for you to enter, to get bacteria in. And a lot of our patients that are on peritoneal dialysis live outside of the hospital and take care of this dialysis on their own every day. Um, and you may not even know the person that is next to you that's having that done. Um, I remember one lady was having it done and doing her peritoneal dialysis and then she told me that, and I didn't know, and she said, um, oh, that she was gonna go get a kidney transplant from her husband um, in the next couple of weeks. And I said, I didn't even know that you had you know, renal failure, and she says, oh, yeah, and so then she <laughs> she's got her bags, you know, that, that setting there, and uh, for uh, infusion, she'd hang it up and infuse it, and then she'd let it drain out, and then she would roll it all up and walk around, do whatever she had to do, and do it as often as she had to do to maintain her uh, kidney, uh, well, not maintain her kidney function, but to maintain her body homeostasis from her kidneys not working properly. So I went, wow, I had no clue. So I thought that was really good. But what an easy way for bacteria to get in through that trocar there if she's not doing good technique, but she was. Okay, so um, per uh, peritoneal dialysis is another way. Trauma, I talked to you about knife, gunshot wounds. Okay, so let's look at symptoms. Um, the symptoms that we will see with this patient is they have a very rigid, distended abdomen. It's board-like they will complain of severe abdominal pain. They will have nausea and vomiting. They will have a high fever and they will have leukocytosis. This is greater than 20,000, okay? They will have signs of dehydration. Uh, they will have a weak rapid pulse, shallow respirations, a low BP, a low urine output. So this patient's getting in trouble and going into shock. <clears throat> And their abdominal x-ray will show free air and fluid in the peritoneum. So that will be the indications that this patient is in trouble. Treatment, this patient should immediately be made MPO. We will put an NG tube down to do gastric decompression. We will give them IV fluids. And we will definitely give them narcotics uh, to help with the pain control. Antibiotics will be given as well to fight off the infection. And we will take them into surgery for immediate surgical closure of the perforated area. 
nursing interventions. Uh, we will do uh, our routine post-op care. So we, what's our routine post-op care? It is coughing and deep breathing. It is turning and ambulating. It's leg exercises. It's all those things that make, uh, make sure we don't get rid of the things that are typical complications from uh, surgery. But for this patient also, we need to go ahead and watch for signs of dehydration, electrolyte imbalance. <clears throat> because and we, cause we're going to be maintaining them with IV fluid, so we would expect that we might have to be uh, doing some sliding scales for um, electrolytes. We're going to manage their gastric decompression, so that NG tube and suction needs to be set at what it needs to be, and I'm going to go over that in a few minutes. Um, and then the way that we know that they are actually recovered is that their WBCs come down. Okay, so we our WBCs return to normal, and normal is? Five to 10,000, right, absolutely. Got to know that like you know your name, okay? So let's look at colorectal cancer. I think if you click on that, right click on that colorectal cancer, it'll take you to, I don't know if it's somebody singing or what, but somebody doing something. Um, Definition of this is uh, a malignant tumor, uh, an adenocarcinoma, in the rectum or the sigmoid colon. Um, and 50% of them actually metastasize to the liver before we diagnose them. And the reason is, is that detection is difficult, okay? Um, what ends up happening with our colorectal cancers is that it diff Detection is difficult. Uh, polyps uh, will grow in our intestinal tract internally, and so there's no symptoms in the early stages that this polyp has now become cancerous, okay? And it isn't until we start having um, bl blood loss and anemia and uh, pain that we come in, and then that ends up usually being too late. I mean, I'm not usually. It is most commonly too yet late. Um, they say here that um, when people are diagnosed, a third of them will die from the disease because they're too, it's too late. So uh, what are the risk factors that we have for this patient? And, you, and I think I have a picture here on their colon cancer. Look, here there's a polyp up there, and then it's going to become cancer. Um, it takes about 10 years, they say. So that's why colonoscopies, when I, I'll pull, cover that in a minute, but really is effective for screening and making sure that patients don't develop colorectal cancer. Rest factors for this particular disease, certainly a family history, a close relative having had colon cancer is a high risk. Uh, any personal history of intestinal polyps uh, puts you at risk, as well as a history of the inflammatory bowel diseases, such as uh, ulcerative colitis, or uh, diverticulitis, diverticulosis. Um, if you have a diet that is low in fiber and high in fat and refined su uh, sugars, you're also at risk, so the American diet. Um, and being above 50, uh, older than 50 years old puts you at risk too, okay? So I don't have a family history. I don't have a personal history of those things, but I, my diet's not good and I'm older than 50. So I have two of the risk factors. So definitely I should be doing my screening to make sure, and I am, I'm being good. All right, um, symptoms of this disease, a change in elimination, alternating between constipation and diarrhea. Uh, the problem is, of course, with this disease is that by the time we see symptoms, they're already in trouble. Uh, rectal bleeding, blood in the stool, lower abdominal pain, weight loss and anemia. I've seen patients come in with colorectal cancer that had a um, hemoglobin of eight um, before they really realized that they were in trouble, you know, because it, it can happen over a long period of time and uh, people can justify what their symptoms are. Say, well, I'm just really tired because I've been doing this and this and this. Or they can say, oh, I don't have health insurance or I don't, this or that, I'm not, I'm okay, it'll probably go away. I mean, we can justify a lot of things, and especially if we don't like to go to the doctor, it's, it can be easily justified. Um, complications of this particular disease is intestinal obstruction, 
uh, which can then lead to perforation and peritonitis. Other problems we see are abscesses, fistulas, and hemorrhage. Hemorrhage is a really common one that we see where it just, they wait too long and it just really ends up, um, they bleed and we've got to first get the bleeding under control before we can even go and take care of the problem. Treatment for this one is uh, drug therapy is, uh, first off we're going to look at l trying to help with the symptoms. So analgesics are certainly one of the medication groups that we would want to give to try and control the abdominal pain and cramping. Antiemetics is another group that we would consider if they're having problems with nausea. Uh, chemotherapy medications are uh, another group that we want to go with to try and control the growth of that tumor. Uh, so the monoclonal antibodies is very good to slow down the cell growth of the tumor. And also the anti-angiogenesis agents are also good because they uh, actually affect the growth of the blood vessels in the tumor. So it's another way to try and control that tumor, especially if you're not going to remove it. Okay. Another surgery, uh, another treatment option is surgery, which is one of the ones we most commonly see. Um, it can be anywhere from a simple pol uh, colonoscopy, where they're removing the polyps, to um, uh, a more extensive surgery. Um, here we see like where they will remove uh, the rectum and the sigmoid colon, and they'll form a stoma to remove, um, I got ahead of myself there they do a colon resection. So when they do a colon resection, they're going to remove that part of the intestine that is affected by the tumor. So it just really depends on where it is, will depend on what kind of uh, fecal diversion that they're going to put into place. Uh, what did I write here? I wrote, uh, they'll remove the, they could be um, here, because we are dealing with the colon rectal, colorectal, this is kind of this, this is kind of, uh, misrepresenting this picture that I have here um, because really what is affected in the uh, patient with a colorectal cancer is right here, okay? So when we have here, we're going to go right above here, okay, to remove that tumor, okay? So, but the problem that ends up happening here is that they need to um, remove the rectum and the sigmoid colon, and then they form a stoma by bringing up that loop of the colon. So they'll bring up the loop right here at the bottom and bring it up to the abdomen so that you have a colonoscopy, and then they will sew uh, the anus shut, okay? So that obviously no rectal temps or suppositories for this patient, okay? So you always need to be thinking about your patients. How often do we do rectal temps anymore? I think it's pretty rare. I'm happy to have that gone. Um, I remember when I gave an oral temperature to a patient and she chomped down on it. It was a glass thermometer. It was like, oh my gosh. So I'm so thankful the type of thermometers that we have now, the ear ones and the temporal and even the one, the older fashioned one, the one that we just put in their mouth, so so much better than what we used to do. You make sure you got the right color though. That's right, you had to go with the red, not the blue, for the rectal. Yeah. I had someone tell me what the difference is between the rectal and the oral. The taste. <laughs> <laughs> I just hope this doesn't go on all over the world. Oh yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's bad. Okay, um, the mercury. Yeah, we had to we had to clean her mouth all out. They did. She did okay. There was no problems. You know, I was one of those times. I learned, you know, when in doubt, put it under their arm <laughs> uh, rather than a glass one. Now we don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Not until you got cooler. But that amount of mercury is like a little drop. Oh, you, you have a lot of good techniques here for mercury. Well, now we don't have that anymore. So we can't tempt anyone to go and uh, use that. Okay, so let's see. So uh, we talked about the surgeries here. Uh, let's talk about what we do as nurses. So for as a nurse, one of the biggest things that we need to do 
is to encourage our patients to have the screening, okay? Um, we want to advise any high-risk uh, patient to have regular colorectal screening, and that means that they should have testing of their stools for uh, cult blood, um, and they usually it will have you do three. They'll send you three, uh, the Guiax at home, and you get a stool sample on it each day and send it off, okay? Um, but one of the things that we do need to remember is there's some things that we can eat that can really um, deviate a, a guaiac, and that is aspirin, vitamin C, and red meat. So you should stay away from those items uh, before uh, doing that testing. And it usually will say that on the uh, letter that they'll send you. A sigmoid, a sigmoid, a sigmoid oscopy is uh, a very low level uh, testing where they'll just look at the lower um, part of your colon and that's really effective for the colorectal cancer. But if uh, for uh, a colonoscopy I think is even better as you get older because they can look at the full range of the colon, okay? Um, they say that they can prevent 90% of the colorectal cancers with early diagnosis. That's a really good percentage. Okay, and they say that if you're over the age of 50, you should have screening every five years. Um, I went a couple of years ago, and I got a good pass, and they said, come back in seven. My s husband went this last year, and they said, come back in ten. I don't know why he got the better deal. <laughs> Men are, it's, I've been working, I, this is my husband's first one, and it was an experience. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, that go lightly, you know, that you have to drink. How many people have drank that? A few, one person here. Two, three, so three of us. It is the worst thing to drink in the world. And you gotta drink this much of it, okay? And you gotta drink it over two hours, okay? So I, as one of the girls at my needlepoint that had had it said, okay, we'll do this, this, and this. So I did these different techniques. It was really a good idea. So I'm just guzzling it, guzzling it. And I have only two, eight, two more eight ounce bottles left. And I'm just doing so good. I'm way through it. I'm like going, oh, this is great. I better slow down. I'm go doing so good. So I slow down. I stop. <laughs> and I like, I'm, 45 minutes later, I say to myself, you better finish that up. I, I, it was like, it was like the kiss of death. I could like, <laughs> it was like, it was horrible. It was just horrible. My husband, I, I did the same technique for him and he's like going like, drinking a little bit, drinking a little bit. I said, you got to guzzle it, honey. You just got to get it down. You know, he said, it tastes horrible. I said, I know. Four hours later, we finally got it down him. That's, I, they have never offered me the pills. That's 100% better. I wonder why Kaiser doesn't let you do that. I'm going to talk to him next time. Because that is a horrible thing to drink. A horrible thing to drink. It tastes like salt water. It's the only way I know how to explain it. You do. And I, one time I had like a 96 year old lady who was just, I mean, she was so skinny and frail and obviously at the end of her life and she was in for a GI bleed. And so they wanted her to drink this to clear her. Can you imagine trying to do that for a woman? I mean, it was cruelty, you know, it, it was, it was, we got it down. Chilling it really helps a lot. Really helps. Chilling it, it really helps. Yes? It's not as, it's a, it's a lower level one. That's a real, that works uh, okay for the, uh, if you were just having a sigmoid, uh, maybe the lower level, they might let you get away with that and an enema and MPO. So, but yeah, if they're looking at the whole colon, they don't want to go in and then it have stool on there and you really do need to clear it. Um, okay. Also, other things that we can encourage them to do is have the genetic screening that can detect any of the chromosomal markers. Uh, remember, we want them to get those pol polyps removed because we know if we remove them, um, 
my husband had a couple of polyps, so that was good. Got those removed. The only reason he went is two people uh, uh, that were friends of the family uh, had colon uh, cancer diagnosis last year. That's the only reason I got him in finally, because I, you know, I can nag. So. <laughs> So anyways, we got him to do it. Uh, let's see if we can get him again in 10 years. Um, I probably should start now. Uh, prepare surgery, prepare the patient for surgery and allow them to express their fears and concerns. So after surgery, post-op care is going to be our routine post-op care, but we need uh, to teach them about stoma care and we need to also remember uh, that this patient will come back to us MPO. Uh, they'll typically have an NG tube to suction um, with that stoma. Prognosis for these patients with colorectal cancer, overall 62% five-year survival rate. Uh, but our patients that are found late, 5%, um, uh, and most of them are late. So that means only 5% of them will make it to the five-year mark. So this is one of those ones that we can diagnose so, we can take care of so effectively early so we really need to be really proactive and push to have this done, okay? And that's why I like being a Kaiser patient because Kaiser really pushes for prevention and they really want you to go in because it's cheaper for them to do a colonoscopy and remove the polyp than to do colorectal surgery and have to go through all the chemotherapy. So I know financially it's a good idea for them, but it's just a good idea for me too. So I like that. Fecal diversions, next one. I really like teaching about fecal diversions. I'm so glad they didn't take this one away from me when we went from the LVN to the RN program. Okay, so fecal diversions, also called bowel diversions, uh, they say that there's about 750,000 patients with ostomies um, in the United States and the average age is 70 years old, okay? There's different types and we're, I'm gonna go over some of just the big ones because there's always a new flavor of the month of some doctor creating some new GI thing, okay? But let's look at the ones that, the most common ones you're gonna see are the ileostomy and the colostomy, okay? So let's look at ileostomy. This is where a loop of the ileum is brought to the skin surface from the, uh, to form a stoma and it's formed in the right lower quadrant. You can see a picture there of the man with his stoma there. Uh, there is uh, no water absorption because there's no colon. Remember, it's our colon that actually absorbs all the fluids out. So that means that this is going to be a very liquid affluent, okay? This affluent is going to be liquidy. Um, so we will need to have a continuous pouch over the stoma because the stooling is going to be constant. How many of you have seen ileostomies? Okay, really a, a more common thing that we see. Um, okay, so that's there, and you can see where this is, and we brought it up. Okay. On the colon, uh, colostomies, on the other hand, is this is where a loop of the colon is brought to the surface to form a stoma, um, and the location will determine the consistency of the stool. So it, when we look at it, we just have to think about where we are in the colon will depend on how much fluid is in it. So if we had a tumor here and we had to do a colonoscopy, right, a, I'm sorry, a colostomy right here, it would still be a pretty liquid um, uh, stool. If you went for the transverse, uh, we're going to start getting more of a semi-liquid. Uh, down on the descending, we'll get pasty, and if we were to go into the sigmoid, it would be actually uh, pretty solid, okay? So, um, and here is an example of a stoma, and I'm guessing it was probably a descending from the location there. Okay, um, a con and uh, for these, they'll usually have a continuous pouch over the stoma unless it's in the sigmoid area. And some of our patients, they'll get themselves so regular that they can go without having something, um, a pouch over it because they know when they're going to be stooling, okay? And some of them, will actually go ahead and do enemas and just clear it out early in the day so that they can be more uh, active and, and, ha and live without that pouch more, okay? Um, but in general, usually there will be a pouch on this type of patient as well, okay? So here's pictures of the different types of stomas that we can see based on the locations of 
This one, the uh, double barrel, we just don't see as often as we used to. You used to see it a lot when I came out of nursing school. What they would do is remove the tumor or remove whatever the problem was and then come back three months later and put them back together. We just don't see that as often as we used to. I, I just, it's not necessary. Okay, let's talk about some other types of fecal diversions. The continent uh, ileostomy, also known as the cock, cock, K-O-C-K, -K, named after a doctor. Um, the, uh, this is a continent ileostomy. Uh, what ends up happening on this one is they actually form an internal pouch using part of the intestine and then bring the stoma up. And then um, this, the, that pouch is used to hold the feces. And then you have to catheterize to um, remove it. So uh, it's an internal pouch that's made from a section of the ileum. And stool will collect there. And eventually, this pouch will uh, stretch to where it can hold like 600 ml of feces. Um, there is a nipple valve at the end where the stoma is crea created um, inside that stoma. And so no feces will come out. Um, and usually all they'll do is put either a moist gauze or a stoma cap over that, um, except when they're catheterizing. So this is a patient that has to periodically catheterize themselves through the stoma. And they'll use like a 28 French or 28 French uh, catheter. And they insert it in about two inches into the, um, through the stoma. And they do, in the beginning, you have to do it like every few hours. But then, um, ultimately, they'll do it like three to four times a day. OK? Yes. Well, if it over, if it get, if they got diarrhea, this is this is diarrhea because this is an ileostomy. We've got liquid, we've got liquid stool here. Okay, so the thing is, is that we did. No, 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 no. This is the uh, this they 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 this is not used. The gray part is not being used. So what they've done is they basically have taken part of the ileum and made a pouch and then pulled it and attached it to the uh, small intestine and then the stoma and put it up here so you've bypassed this entire section here on the large intestine. Yes, it just it doesn't get used. No, it doesn't, surprisingly, it doesn't. So it's your own tissue. It will, it will just, anything that we just leave in the, in the thing, it'll just atrophy. Yes. So let's say that I am a 30-year-old person that ends up having to have this surgery for whatever reasons. Um, could be even a trauma, you know, whatever. And so do I want to have this, you know, as I'm having sex with my husband, do I want to have a colonoscopy, uh, ileostomy bag here? No, I don't. So this is a really good alternative for a person to be able to have a more normal life, OK? And, um, and, and, with, and I'm seeing it be more successful. I don't see a lot of people doing it, because typically, as we know, the typical age of a patient that has this is 70. So they tend to not go to this direction. But uh, definitely would be something I would recommend for a younger patient, absolutely, OK? Um, other things, good question, though. Um, OK. So in the beginning, we have to catheterize quite a bit. Later on, we don't. If this patient came into the ED, we would need to know because somebody better catheterize that stoma, right? So when you see a stoma on a patient and nothing's coming out, you better figure out, is this one of those uh, continent ileostomies? Is it a continent urostomy? I mean, there's different types of things out there. Um, and I'll talk, tell you when we talk to GU, uh, a one that had gotten missed and the problems with that one. Uh, so no stoma bag for this patient, OK. Uh, another type of fecal diversion that we have is the ileoanal reservoir. Uh, this is where we are going to um, keep the anus intact. And this only works if the anus is disease free. So let's say that you had colorectal cancer or you had a higher level cancer and you wanted to remove uh, that portion and connect. You could do this if the uh, anus is, uh, is disease free. So what we do with this is it's a two-stage surgery. 
What they do is they do a colectomy with the creation of the reservoir and a temporary ileostomy. After that, and the next picture I think shows it even better, uh, the internal pouch is made from the ileum. It's sutured to the anal canal. And what ends up happening is you're going to see mucus coming out from the anus and feces will be coming out of the ileostomy. So we bypass, let me see if I see the surgery here. So what, this is the two part. They make the ileostomy here and then they make the ileoanal reservoir here. So what you'll see here in the first part of the surgery, you'll see a lot of mucus coming down here because remember all those epithelial cells that are in here uh, will start coming out you'll see the feces coming out there. Then, once this is all healed and we believe that the ileoanal um, reservoir is going to work, then that's when they reconnect it. Okay, so then once they reconnect those two loops there, then we will uh, be able to have feces coming out through here. The problem that these patients have is, uh, used to have was here, the sphincter being affected. But now we can put artificial sphincters in and so we, the person can just deflate the sphincter and, and have the bowel movement. And so that is a really good option too. And um, I've seen some patients with this. It works. The art, now that we have the artificial sphincter, it really works. It wasn't really working before, before the artificial sphincter was created. Yes? So they inflate and deflate the sphincter? What is that, like a pump or something? It is. It's a pump. Um, I have one here, a picture of it under a urinary one. Um, that I'll pass around. This one was for urinary, but it can be used anywhere you want. It has a, uh, uh, the sphincter is put into the location, and then you have a, 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 a drain that's attached to a bulb, and you have a drain that's attached, uh, a, tube, a tube that's attached to a pump, and a tube that's attached, attached to a reservoir. And then you can just pump up, with the one and release with the uh, and, and release it. So uh, uh, this is for GU, but it's the same principle. So um, yeah, this works really well, and they use the same principle uh, we'll be talking about in, in male urinary uh, for the uh, penile prosthesis. It's the same thing. They have a, a reservoir that's full, and then they pump up the uh, um, cylinders, allows the man to be erect. And then he can press it and release it. <coughs> it looks like it's on the inside. Right? It is on the inside. I never knew that. I just assumed it was hanging out. No, it's all in the inside. It's all internal. Yeah. Wow. So very cool. And, and you know, I'm sure that they'll be able to even do it more naturally every year. Okay. Moving on here. So that's the ileal anal reservoir. The stoma is... Uh, removed and the two sections are reconnected. At first there is stool incontinence, but later they get sphincter control. If they have an artificial sphincter, they have control from the beginning. Uh, stool will always be liquid though, so inspect the anal area often for evidence of excoriation because they bypassed uh, that absorption of the fluids. Okay? All right, what are some of the complications that can happen with fecal diversion? Um, well, fluid and electrolyte imbalance uh, is uh, something that they have to deal with due to the constant liquid stooling. So this patient needs to always consume about three to four liters of fluid per day. Uh, intestinal obstruction is another complication that we see. Uh, it is, uh, can occur because of a recurrent tumor or it can be because they didn't uh, digest their food well enough. Um, that lady that had the uh, short bowel syndrome at um, that sniff that I took the Palomar students to, uh, we would see crackers that she just partially, that she had eaten come through, you know. So uh, you, they have to chew their food well, okay. Uh, so you really want to tell them to uh, chew their food thoroughly, especially your ileostomy patients, uh, to avoid high fiber foods such as celery and to avoid enteric coated pills or capsules, you'll just see those come right out. So, all right. Uh, also another problem that we have uh, is skin integrity. Uh, they can have a loss of skin integrity around the stoma and that can be due to either uh, 
the feces leaking around the area or it could be uh, the adhesive irritating the skin or even an infection. So they need to really maintain good uh, skin care to that area. Uh, gas and odor, another problem. Uh, the most common causes of this is that they're not changing their pouch frequently enough. Um, it can also be foods. Certain foods uh, cause uh, odors and certain medications will cause it. Uh, the most common medications that cause smell for our patients with a fecal diversion are the TB meds, the tuberculosis meds, and also certain antibiotics cause uh, smell. So how can we solve that problem? Well, empty the bag when it's one-third to one-half full is the first thing. Um, we can add liquid or tablet deodorants. Literally, some people will just put a little squirt of Dawn into their um, bag, but they sell these little tiny tablets that you can just put into your bag, and that will help with any smell. Um, you need to encourage your patient to avoid foods that might cause uh, more gas, such as the typical ones that give all of us trouble, cabbage and beans, because it's going to really blow up that pouch for them, and so we really don't want to. Uh, encourage them to eat more slowly. Remember that if you are chewing gum or swallowing a lot of air, that's going to show up in that pouch, okay? Um, and yogurt and parsley, if you like to eat those, those are really good for deodorizing. So chew a little parsley, eat a little yogurt, okay? All right. Stoma prolapse is another complication for this patient. Um, this is when the stoma prolapses. Um, it can either protrude outward or it can actually shrink inward. Um, and what ends up happening is you get a, the blood supply being restricted. Um, it will appear pale or blanch or even black with necrosis. I've seen some that one edge of it was black. Um, if you see this ever, it should look brick red or bright red. If it does not look like that, if it's pink, you need to be talking to your primary care nurse. Um, and this, if it's prolapsed, surgery will be, may be needed. Usually it's needed, okay, to fix that problem. Sexual function is another complication. Uh, this is uh, especially true if nerve is involved, any nerves are involved during the surgery. Uh, they try to avoid and, and keep away from the nerves that might uh, affect uh, sexual function, but sometimes they're not able to depending on the surgery location of the tumor. Um, but also, it can also uh, affect their sex life as far as um, having a disturbed body image and, and feeling that, that their partner will not, uh, will be uh, grossed out by the stoma. And, you know, so this is something that we really need to try and help them work through. So, uh, next thing here is talking more about the body image. Um, it, the adjustment of, to the body image is very individual. I've seen patients that had no problem with it, and I've seen other patients that wouldn't touch or look or anything. I remember my mother-in-law had a, um, a very small a microscopic perforation from her uh, ulcerative colitis, and so the doctor wanted to go in and do surgery, and he thought he told her that he that they might have to do a col colostomy, and she said, "I'd rather die than have a colostomy." I went, "Really?" I mean, you know, she was in her 80s, early 80s. So I went, I didn't quite get that, but some people really s see that, and they go, yeah, that's how I would feel too. I think my husband's probably like that. He's just, he, anything to avoid any kind of surgery. Um, so, uh, so that's, it's gonna, adjustment is gonna vary from person to person. Very important that you watch your own reaction, because, you know, you know, it can be offensive, the smell, or, the, you know, you're dealing with all, that uh, liquid stool, especially with the ileostomy, and sometimes it doesn't quite go where you want it to go. It's almost like a, a baby that's got diarrhea. It's not always easy to control. So you need to really control the way that you're um, reacting and you're, um, that you're not showing any kind of distaste or uh, disgust. Um, you should really encourage uh, your patient to uh, use other resources. Uh, an enteral stomal therapist is a wonderful person to use that will come in and help decide what kind of appliance would be the best for this. Uh, sometimes the wound care team will do that or they'll find someone to come in 
uh, to really educate them on it. Also having an ostomy uh, group visitor is a good one, a person that comes in that already has one of those stomas and can show, look, I'm doing great with this. You know, this is just, you just have to get used to this. This is a transition and can give them some positive uh, feedback. Nursing implications for us, well, at pre-op, we need to try to do some teaching about stoma care. Uh, be sure to start your bowel prep two to three days before surgery because we want to get this as clean and clear as possible. Post-op, uh, we, of course, are going to do our routine post-op care, but this patient, we would expect to have an NG tube for gastric decompression, so we want to watch for dehydration. We also want to monitor the color and the amount and the consistency of the stool, and we also want to be watching that stoma. Uh, stoma care? Stomach care. Um, so when you're looking at a stoma, you need to daily inspect the stoma. It should appear round and moist and pinkish red in color, or I like to use the word brick red, but I see Tri-City doesn't have that color as a choice. So um, beefy red's another, but you won't see that one either. But look at how how full this one is. Now, th as, they, as it gets older, it will shrink. Okay, it's very swollen in the beginning, large and swollen, and it shrinks over the next six to eight weeks. Uh, you need to check that stoma, the color, but then you also need to check the area around to make sure there's no fecal uh, leakage or any reaction to the adhesive from the uh, appliance. You want to empty the pouch through the distal uh, spout as needed, and sometimes uh, you need to rinse it, okay? Um, and usually what I'll use is I'll use a piston syringe and I'll just have it over, you know, if they can go to the bathroom, that's great. If they can't, then you just kind of use it over a bedpan and just uh, irrigate the uh, bag and, and clean it out that way. Or change the bag, okay? Um, but at home, they typically will try and save their bags longer. Um, you, if the best thing to do is to... Um, change the entire ostomy appliance when the bowel is relatively quiet. And so a patient will get a routine. And the most usual times that the bowel is uh, quiet is before breakfast or two to three hours after meals. Okay? So when we do it like around 10 o'clock, that's a good time. Okay? Um, okay. I want to show you a few things about... Let's go back here. Let's talk about NG tube. I'm going to bring this out here, and we're going to look at what you should expect in the room with a patient that has an NG tube for decompression. The first thing that we should see is an irrigation and drainage tray. Okay, This should be in the room, and it should have on it the date on the side. It should be changed every 24 hours at Tri-City is the rule. Okay, and it also you should have some saline or water, depending on the type of, in this case, wa uh, saline, and it should be dated, okay? Also in here, you should put uh, either a 10 or 20 cc ml um, syringe, lure lock, and they have 21, 20 at um, Tri-City, but I just happen to have a 10, okay? So that's one of the things you should have. When you look at your patient, they will have an NG tube that is attached to suction. And when you look at the suction here, you need to make sure that all the ports are closed. Okay, So this port here is the one that goes to the actual machine. Now these, I'm, the ones I'm using here are definitely not the ones that Tri-City has, right? But what we should be looking for when we look at these suction things is that an NG should always be on low suction, okay? That means the green section um, at Tri-City. It's, it's, if you've got it to the yellow, it should be right at the edge below the yellow if you're having problems getting all the secretions. But it should not, it, green is preferred. The other thing that you have to also look at, is it at constant or continuous suction, okay? And for um, your patients, it could be either or. It will always say LIS or LCS, 
meaning low intermittent suction or low constant suction, okay? So um, you need to look at that. And you know at, at Tri-City we have to kind of lean into that one little section in between the patients and look. It's not always so easy to look, but it's part of your um, morning assessment. When you do the head to toe, you get to the NG tube, you follow it all the way back, make sure that it's at the setting it should be, that everything is connected. I've seen where the patient's feeling nauseated and one of the connectors up here, like let's say this one, was open, okay? And it's easier to happen than you think, okay? The other thing that you need to do here is, besides knowing what the suction is, uh, you also need to look at the NG tube that's in the patient, okay? So when the NG tube is in the patient, okay, and um, attached here, if it's on constant, we should see constant fluid being moved through, okay? Uh, if it's intermittent, you'll see it stop, then move, stop, then move, okay? And so that's what you would expect. If the patient's complaining of nausea, I really look to see, do I think that enough of the NG tube is in, okay? So if I see this whole section, <laughs> sometimes I go, oh, I know that's not in far enough. But anyways, usually we check the x-ray, and more and more I see that it's in place and secure, especially with the new securement devices. They tend to stay in place better. Okay. So we come into the room, and at eight, every two hours, we need to do some things to help with this. The first thing that we need to do is we come in, and we make sure that it's running what it should be, that all the things are, all the mechanics are right. Then we go and we make sure that we vent and flush it, okay? So every four hours, we have to vent and flush. So when we flush, we're going to take up 20 mLs of normal saline, and we are going to disconnect here, and we are going to flush that. Just put the saline right through, hook it right back up, okay? So it's making sure that it's not clogging up, okay? Then the next thing is we're going to vent, and we're going to do 20 mLs for this one too. We're going to look at this reflex valve here, and we're going to look at this, and this should be nice and clean. If it's not clean, if it's got any drainage in here at all, this needs to be removed and put a new one on, okay? This is called a Lopez, no, an anti-reflux valve. So when we look at this, this is what we're going to do. We're going to vent it by putting this on and putting the 10 through and putting another 10 through. Now, this is one of those situations that, like, um, a bathroom. You can't flush the bathroom if there's not an air vent up to the top of the roof. This is your air vent, okay? And this will not drain if the air vent is clogged up, okay? So you have to vent this every two hours and flush this every four hours. So you'll see when I put it on my task thing, I'll put eight, vent and flush, 10, vent, 12, eight, vent and flush, two, vent and that'll be on my schedule, and then I just check it off. Do you have to be right on the time? No, okay? You can be off a half hour. This is not a big, this is not one of those crucial ones. Um, but if your patient is having nausea, that there's a sign here that that decompression isn't working. Something's, ha something's going wrong. And if you look and see that you're not getting much drainage out and they're nauseated, something's wrong. So you have to start doing some problem solving, okay? Um, are all of you familiar with this uh, reflux valve? Do you want me to pass it around or no? You good? Okay. All right. So if you have a patient uh, with a NG tube, you should expect to see uh, Vicki and I come around and see you at 8 o'clock because we'll go over that whole thing with you, okay? But now you know what you're to do and uh, you need to put it in place, okay? It's not very hard, okay? And the nice thing about most of the GI things is it's just like plumbing. It's just logical, pretty much, okay? All right, um, that was NG tubes. All right, let's talk about, let me turn this off. 